everybody. Welcome to our second Data Science Education Webinar of 2018. This webinar is being made available through the Concord Consortium, which is a nonprofit edtech laboratory based in Concord, Massachusetts, in Emeryville, California. I'm here from Emeryville with Bill and Tim. You can learn more about our webinars at our website, concord.org forward slash meetup. I'd like to introduce you to today's facilitator, Tim Erickson of e EPS Media. Tim is a freelance science and math educator. He's working with Meg Holmberg out in Oakland. He's currently working on the NSF project data science games from the Concord Consortium. A recorded version of this webinar will be made available on YouTube. We will email you details about it through Eventbrite after the event. If you're comfortable sharing your name and face, please turn on your web camera during the webinar event. We like to see you. I'd also like to emphasize that the format of this webinar is participatory by design. This means that we are going to work together to decide the conversations, the connections, and the activities that we want to discuss today. Uh, Bill, who's sitting across from me, and I will be facilitating the live questions that you have. We're also managing a back channel through the Zoom chat interface, so if you'd like to ask questions that way. I'll be managing the text-based questions on Zoom chat, and um, Bill will be managing the live questions as well. Tim will explain the participatory by design nature in just a few moments. For those of you just joining us, welcome to our webinar. Our speaker is Tim Erickson, who will be speaking about the Kodak strengths and weaknesses with respect to data science education and trees. Trees, yes. Tim, I'll let you take it from here. Okay, great. Um, so most of you, you got here somehow, and I want to uh, make sure that you can find your way to the slides and the document. And so I'm going to share my screen in just a moment. So I'm going to go back to Zoom and I'm going to share my screen. And I want to share my entire screen. So I'll do that. So now you can see your saw. Ah, there you go. So that's me. And I'm going to, I have a bunch of slides. And I'm going to, I'm going to actually try to present. I'm not used to using Google Slides, but here we are presenting the first slide. Okay, and so this is Trees for Classification and, in, and Shrove Tuesday is tomorrow, apparently. And in the upper right hand is a bit.ly short link. And that will take you to my Google Doc landing page. And on that landing page are all of the different links that you will see, including a link to these slides. And so you can follow along these slides with your own copy of these slides, and you should have right access to these slides because you will add to them as we go along. Um, and so, I think it's about 2018. You're right, it is 2018. Why it says 2012 is a mystery. Hmm. Yeah. So, use 2018, and I will go out and oh, fix that right away. Better. So slide, edit, master. How did I do that? Is totally, oh, come on. I posted so, the correct link in the Zoom chat interface too. Right, though so everyone else who is here. Duh, duh. There we go. And so now we will go out here and we'll present this. Look, like it says, it's DSC February 2018. <laughs> I'm not six, uh, six years slow. And so let us, let us move on from there and we'll say welcome. And um, there are some housekeeping things to do. And so we'll say, first of all, the upper right is our landing page. We did that. Uh, you might want to bookmark that tab and it has links to everything you might want, including these slides. And the links are also in the slides. So if you follow along in the slides, you will be able to actually do stuff. And actually doing stuff is part of participatory by design. And there are two aspects of that. One is that this is not going to be me talking the whole time, although there was a substantial amount of that. You will actually use the software in order to do things during this webinar. But in doing things, we also want to be able to reflect on what we're doing and share what we're doing. At the moment, I see nine pictures on the big screen which means that with this many people, we can almost, you can almost raise your hand and I can call on you and you can talk. Be sure to unmute yourself when you talk. 
you can talk and we can all hear what you say and that will be fine. But if we get a lot of people, it will be important to be able to write things down. And there are two ways to do that. One way is in the slides themselves, there are some places where I explicitly want you to type stuff. Hello, kitty. And um, you can also send in chat questions to Talia Hill will interrupt me appropriately. Okay, everybody understand? Please signify by either going like this or going like that. Okay, okay, great. Um, so if you happen to be in a room with somebody else and you all look like you might be in a room alone, it's really great to do these things with other people. If you can't, that's all right. Um, let's see what else. We will be using CodeApp. Person with a kidney. Yeah. So, and, or, or put the kitty somewhere else or something like that. Um, how many of you, just with a little show of hands, anybody not ever used Codap before? Ooh, Francesco, great. Um, so most everyone has used Codap. Um, here no, is, I used it. sorry? I haven't used it yet, this is Donna. Oh, Donna, hi, all right, we cannot see your hand come up, that's all right. So there, it may be that you will be able to catch up just fine if we go on, but if you're totally unfamiliar, you could kind of in the background, kind of in the background. Well, sorry? Someone just said something, well, that's all right. If you're totally unfamiliar with CodeApp, you can get to the getting started example document and I'm going to quickly run through that and you could practice on your own. It says go here and so if I actually click, it will take me to the Kodak example document. And it says in the instructions on the slide, it says open document or browse examples. And there's a thing called getting started with Kodak and I will open it click like this, and what you will see is this thing. And it has in it a bunch of different things that you can do, like drag this data file into CodeApp. What could that possibly mean? And so I click show me, and it says, oh, look at that. I grab the, oh, that thing, I drag it over there. Okay, let's see, I'm gonna try it now. I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna drag it Oh, look at the plus sign. That's really great. That's what we want to see. And now I have data and I got some response to that. That is, there's this little intro to how to do basic things in CodeApp so that you will learn. Come on, there we go. For example, to make a graph, I will go like this. And to make a graph of mass, I will drag mass to an axis of the graph and I will see those things. And so if you are brand new to CodeApp, that's an example of something that you can do. And I'm hoping that, for example, Francesco, that you will see that and you'll say, oh yes, I can sort of follow along and get it. And that we will just move on. But if any of you are having any trouble with CodeApp or there's something important that happened and you don't quite understand it, interrupt me or send a message to Talia or Bill and via the chat in the Zoom, and we will try to take care of it as fast as possible. Excuse me, Tim, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, just out of curiosity, how is Code, uh, CodeApp related to Fathom? So, uh, CodeApp is a descendant of Fathom. So you will notice if you have used Fathom, Many things work exactly the same way in CodeApp as they do in Fathom, but like all descendants, it is transcending its ancestors and doing some things that Fathom cannot do. There are also things that you can do in Fathom that you cannot yet do in CodeApp, but familiarity with CodeApp will help you understand Fathom. And the Thank you difference is that it's running in a browser. Yes, right. As the thing that we're noticing here is that I'm running Chrome and this data analysis system is running inside it. Um, many people want to know what does it cost? It's free. It's always available to you on the web and things like that. And so um, what 
I should say is I'm going to go back to the um, to the slideshow and say uh, I'm going to just proceed here. We're going to choose here, choose getting started with CodeApp, and we're going to be using plugins and things in CodeApp that are practically brand new. And so uh, I do want to say to you that you know, be flexible and be, be kind because all kinds of things might not work. But the other thing about this is that um, ev everyone is welcome, even if you've never used CodeApp before, but this is about our sixth or seventh webinar. And this is one in which we are going to be doing something, and I alluded to this in the blurb, we're gonna be doing some things that those of us who have used CodeApp a lot and spent a lot of time trying to do data analysis, we find them confusing. And so the early warning is, there are gonna be some moments when you say, oh, wait a minute, do I get this? And the answer is, maybe not at first, and it will take us a little bit of time. And I think this is great for us as educators because it will put us in the position that some of our students are in sometimes of being a little bit confused. And so that's just the warning and maybe everything will go perfectly and you will totally get everything. I wrote some of this software and I did not totally get everything. And so it'll be interesting to see what this is like. So onward. Uh, See, data science education. Okay, so we have in this project and here at Concord Consortium been developing materials that use CodeApp as the platform. And that means a number of things. Usually people who are doing data science use a professional system. They use RStudio or Jupyter Notebook, uh, and it involves a lot of coding. What we do does not involve coding. It uses gestures like the way you saw me make the graph, I mean, there's this question, if you start to use R, how do I make a graph? There's a bunch of code you have to write. And it's part of the nature of computer programming that you have to learn these things. And so it's perfectly okay, but it can be a barrier to some people. And so you just drag the variable to the axis and that makes a graph. So there are gestures. It has its own advantages and disadvantages, but many people find it's easy to get started but it's got a limited scope compared to a professional tool. Now, for today, um, we want to, I want to talk briefly about why do I care about doing data science education with CODAP? One is, I'm worried that instructors assume too much and that sometimes when students are trying to learn things, their basic understanding is missing. And it's nobody's fault. It's perfectly okay. But um, as Jesse was talking about earlier, before we got started, there is this way that maybe some students don't persist because they have failure experiences early that maybe we can figure out how to avoid. And uh, let's see, and I, I can't see a clock. Okay, um, we're at 13 minutes after. I'm going, I had an anecdote from, uh, Joan and I had an experience on, on Thursday. It was very interesting. Um, let me tell you the anecdote briefly. We, we were in a classroom full of students. Every group was adding to a common class data table. And the table was on a whiteboard. So that on the whiteboard, um, Let's see, no, you won't be able to see me. This is what we're seeing. On the whiteboard, you could see uh, three columns of numbers. You could see the age of the people in the data set, the mean height of the boys of that age, and the mean height of the girls at that age. And different groups got different ages and put up the data. And then we were all going to enter all of the class data, which everybody did, and so, you might have the 17-year-olds, and then the 12-year-olds, and then the 14-year-olds, and then the five-year-olds, and then the seven-year-olds, okay? Once, uh, so you, then as a teacher, you walk around and you look at everybody's graph to see if it kind of looks the way it's supposed to. And one student's graph was a total mess. So I looked to see what the problem was. And the student 
being a dutiful student, had entered all the data, realized that the ages were out of order and that things ought to be in order. So she reordered the ages by typing in all the ages in numerical order. They no longer corresponded to the heights that were in the other two columns. And so everything was kind of scrambled. Was she a stupid student? No, of course not. She's doing what students are supposed to do. She is just making sense out of the data and putting them in order. And as a result, she got something that we as data people thought was kind of nutty. You know, you know you, if you move data, you move the entire row. No one had ever told her. Okay, and so, Tim, I think that's an, a wonderful example of how uh, the, of the need for research and how students perceive data. Yeah, so that we can actually. understand where that move on her part is coming from, and anticipate it in our educational materials. Mm -hmm. Possibly that, or just be aware of it as teachers, so that we can intervene in these possibly rare. Uh, idiosyncratic ways that things can go wrong. So let us move on here and I'm going to see what else it says. So here's your first opportunity to add things to a slide. So we're going to be talking about trees and we have said nothing about trees so far. Why are you here? What do you think this webinar is about? What do trees have to do with data science? So you can now type in any box and add things that you think about trees or what are you considering and then we'll just take a minute or two to do this since you for some reason came to a webinar that's about trees and i added one of course Tim, how can we write something in these boxes? Um, so this is one of the questions is, are you? So you should see something like this. And people are um, typing in. I don't know. I believe he needs to go to the slides using the link in the upper right. Yeah, so you should not be presenting the slides to yourself. You should be looking at the slide. And this is slide number four in the deck, if you've missed it. And people are typing, and now you can see, I hope you can see on the screen, everybody's typing. Oh. Right. And you know, if you if you run out of space in the box, be brave and just move somebody else aside and make the box bigger if you like. And there's course, plenty of room at the top. And there's plenty of room at the top. It's like people not sitting in the front row of the class at the time. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, highlight misconceptions. So you can all see what everybody is typing. So one of the things that I'm intrigued here is on the, on the left, perhaps has to do with probability of events, calculating chances of complex events. In a high school math class, one of the places where we, in fact, possibly the only place where we see trees is in modeling probability. And so you'd, you'd make a tree in order to explain how uh, compound probabilities work. So you roll, uh, one die and you you flip a coin and so you'd have heads and tails and then you'd have one two three four five six as the next set of branches okay you, uh, someone says I know sometimes trees are about making decisions with data yes absolutely um, and absolutely what this is about is the next one down how to better help students understand what's happening when we create trees highlight misconceptions that we as educators might encounter I have this belief that sometimes if we have, have students do mysterious things with trees, they don't actually understand what the tree is. Um, oh, you're also for the form of the presentation, ways of grouping data and options. 
okay? Predictions rather than parameters. Ooh, yes. So that person might be talking about what we see in uh, statistics when we do regression and estimate parameters. Uh, and so if we're trying to do a prediction, how is that different from estimating a parameter? And that's a great question. So uh, Chad notes that uh, when you load the link to the Google Doc, it scrolls you to the bottom of it, and uh, you need to scroll up a ways to see the information and the links. Thank you, Chad. Oh, okay. But Chad, oh, there's Chad, yes. He moved over as we lost someone. Okay, so um, I'm going to go back. Thank you very much. I'm gonna go back to presenting and see if this will do it and go to the next slide. And so I mean, we're gonna talk a little bit more in this introduction to trees. Uh, for us, it started with Laura Martignon and risk literacy, and it continued with Joachim Engel, who is with us today. Uh, he works with civic data and he showed, he talked to me about a football, football data set he was interested in, and this intrigued me. And the idea is that Europeans, as you may know, love to play soccer, to play football. And there is a question, whether there is any racism among the officials. And the so there's a bunch of data about a bunch of players and how dark their skin is and whether they get red cards and how many red cards they get. Can we do some sort of prediction or something? And Joachim, who did part of his PhD involving trees, was really intrigued by doing trees in order to do this. And I was mystified. Um, but I started to hear about uh, things such as random forest, which is a data science technique, and got intrigued about what trees might be able to do for me. Now, here's what I worry about, and this is what we alluded to before. Here is a page from a, uh, a book about trees and things like this, and it's about you, American baseball. And what you see as the results at the bottoms are the logarithm base 10 of the salaries of players that have particular attributes. And we are trying to predict how much money a player makes depending on how many hits and RBIs and years in the majors and walks and runs and stuff like that. And this is a result of using a program in R, a package in R that does um, classification and regression trees is called R part and it creates this tree. And so what I worry about is if you're a student and you see this thing, what if you don't even know how a tree works? Right? What, what is this diagram really do? I mean, it's a tree and we look at it and we say, yeah, it's a tree. And many people I've talked to, who have not, do not have experience with trees, look at it and say, well, it looks like roots. <laughs> it doesn't look like a tree. And we say, well, but you see the leaves are at the bottom. And they say, well, in a tree, the leaves are at the top. So this is very mysterious. And so we wanted to come up with a way to shortcut, uh, to not to go through some fancy algorithm in order to create all of these choices but to let people make their own choices. So now I'm gonna move on and talk about uh, some actual data we'll take a look at. So we're gonna look at a famous data set from Green and Mayer. There are 89 observations, and these are people who have come to the emergency room and they have a number of different symptoms. They might have an elevated ST segment on an EKG. I once knew what that was, but I don't at the moment. Just know that if you have an elevated ST segment, that's not a good thing. If you have chest pain, or and then there's a whole bunch of other symptoms, and if you have any one of those four symptoms, that's one of these predictors. And the outcome variable is later on when they were in the hospital, did they have a heart attack? So the deal is you want, the person comes to the ER, should you send them to the cardiac care unit? If they're about to have a heart attack, they should go to the cardiac care unit. If they're not about to have a heart attack, the cardiac care unit's very expensive. 
So maybe it would be better not to send them there. Or maybe we have a limited number of beds in the cardiac care unit. So we need to make a yes or no decision for each new patient, okay? So here's what it looks like if you use uh, our studio, you have these three variables and ST elev is either true or false. And when R and R part do this thing, they say, well, if ST elev is less than 0.5, that is to say it's recoded true and false as zero and one. And so this is, if you do not have an elevated ST, there is a 0.035714 out of n equals 56 rate of actually later having the heart attack. And so this node here is, has a very low probability, which indicates maybe those people should not go to the cardiac care unit, maybe. But over here, it's a higher percentage. 0.39, oh, but if, if they are having chest pain and they have an elevated ST segment, 43% of them do this. Oops, and now I accidentally must have pressed something to show you. This is an example of the R code. And this block here is the representation of the tree. And to me, it's pretty opaque. I can't really look at that block of numbers and tell what the tree is telling me. In fact, <coughs> seeing the tree comes after seeing the block of numbers. So let's see a different approach to getting these data. Now I'm gonna move on and I'm gonna say, we're gonna look at our diagnostic tree thing and it will look like this when you open it. And if you want to say that ST elev is something that you wanna predict, you're gonna drag ST elev into this box Okay, and I'm gonna demo it. You're gonna drag ST elev into this box like that, and then it will change ultimately to look like the thing on the right here, provided that you have clicked show diagnosis leaves, and I'm just about to do this for you, but you can now do it yourself as well. So I'm going to click here, and I'm going to link to the code app document. And up here is the data. And I just want to show you this for a moment. MI is myocardial infarction. Did they have a heart attack? Yes or no? One of means one of the four symptoms. ST elev is the elevated ST segment. And pain means did they have chest pain? Okay, and so I'm going to do just what I suggested. I'm going to take ST elev. And I'm going to drag it in here. And sometimes you may have to do it more than once. Remember I said, be kind. There we go. And so now I'm gonna zoom. Can you, are you guys seeing the zoom? No, you're not, that's too bad, okay. So here is, if you have pain, sorry, if you have the elevated ST segment, that's yes, 13 out of 33 of the people got a heart attack, had MI equals yes. If you did not have an elevated ST segment, two of the 56 people, 3.6%, had a heart attack. Okay. So if I click this box, show diagnosis leaves, these things appear. And I'm going to say, what is it, how, how am I doing if I just ask about the elevated ST segment? And so if I click these question mark things, it says, ooh, uh, if I'm gonna have a heart attack, uh, if, if ST elevated is yes, I'll say yes. And I'll say click again and I get no. Please indicate if you're confused at any moment because we're trying these different things. And so now I have a complete tree because I've made a diagnosis at every leaf or every root, root tip. And, and Tim, yes, uh, just to clarify, the reason we have yes under the one that says yes is because those are the ones that had SDL, not because it's the uh, those are the ones that had the my, myocardial infarction, not, not because it's the yes branch. Of the Correct, 
That's right. Um, and so indeed, um, yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking if I, can, if I can clarify this anymore, but I think you've clarified it nicely. Thank you, Dan. Um, and so this means, yes, I will send them to the cardiac care unit as opposed to no, I will not send them to the cardiac care unit. So Tim, I have a question. This is Steve McGee. Hi, Steve. So did you, were you the one that made that decision or did the system make a recommendation as to ah, whether or not yes or no? Thank you, good question. No, I made the decision. That is, there is no background algorithm that's deciding anything. This is entirely up to me. So if I want to send, if I want to do it the other way, I just click no and yes. And now, if I'm an evil doctor, I am sending all the people with an elevated um, ST segment to the normal place and all the people without one to the, um, to the cardiac care unit. So do I understand that the idea of doing it this way is so that we participate in the mechanism of making the tree? Exactly so that before we turn the mechanism of making the tree, before we turn the algorithm over to the computer, we want the experience ourselves of playing all the roles in the algorithm. And I want to do this kind of in a really small situation where we don't have dozens of uh, attributes and things like that. We have a question. Yeah, just a couple of mechanics. Um, first off, how did you get the question mark to appear on the the yes and no stem, namely? Uh, um, I clicked, to get the question mark to appear, I clicked show diagnosis leaves. So if I don't have that, I don't get question marks and I get a little bit of graphic crud down here. Mm -hmm. But when I click show diagnosis leaves, now they appear. Sometimes you might want to start without making the decision. You just want to see what the proportions are in different cases. But we've gone ahead and tried to make the decision. There is another thing that's useful. Um, and then there's also yeah. a question, how do you get the gray question mark to appear? I think that's before you click on yes and no. Correct. Yeah. Uh, in fact, so let, let me add another part to this. Suppose I look at this 39% uh, of these people I wonder if there's another way to distinguish them better. Let's put chest pain here. So I'm going to grab pain and I'm going to put it on this place. Come on, pain, move. Okay, now I've added a new branch to the tree. And I've said, oh, in addition to having an elevated ST segment, do you have chest pain? And now because we haven't told it, I get question marks in gray. Beautiful. Thank you very much, that answers our question. And so I can see now, oh wow, if you have chest pain, 43% of the people, 10 out of the 23 people, as opposed to 30%, three out of the 10 people, a greater percentage, if you have chest pain and an ST elevated, you're more likely to have a heart attack. And so I'm for sure going to send these people, so I wanna make this into yes, so I click on it, and it makes it yes, if I change my mind, I click on it again. But maybe I want to send both of these people, but I now, I want to find out, can I get rid of some of these people? Wow, okay, so out of the people who do not have chest pain, if you do have one of those segments, that's 37%, I do want to send these people there, but maybe I can release the people who don't have one of those other four sim symptoms. Now, if you're an experienced tree person, you might look at this and say, wait a minute, there are only two people in this condition. Only two people have an elevated ST segment, no chest pain, and none of those other four symptoms. Maybe I shouldn't make a diagnosis on the basis of so few people. But we won't go there, but what we will do is say, who are those two people? And if I click on this box and make it yellow, the two people in question are selected in the table. 
So that means I have a chance to review in the actual data rather than in the tree, who am I talking about? Likewise, if I'm wondering, what about person number 29? What's their story? I'm gonna click in the table and select person number 29, and you can see in the tree that the path of their decision is highlighted. Okay, so the idea here is, if you're a student, and you aren't really sure how this tree thing works, we wanna give you as many affordances as possible to explore and see what's happening in this system. So I'm imagining that many of you might be playing with this right now. Have you nod or go like this? Have you actually been doing some of this yourself so you have the experience? Uh, Tim, I think one of the things that are interesting from a point of view of education is that uh, you are going to have to explain that even you're not even if you're not sending some people to the uh, cardiac care unit, they still might have an MI. And, oh, yes, and that you're kind of taking risks. I think that that is a really good point, and. Um, Dean brings up something that is worth our taking a look at on the display itself and we want to improve this display that we're about to see um, and make it into what's lamentably called a confusion matrix um, but see this line here that says TP equals 13 TN equals 56 etc on the screen yeah. that's there are 13 true positives ah 56 true negatives, 18 false positives, that is to say people we sent to the cardiac care unit who did not have an MI. And the key thing that Frank Adina is talking about is that there are two false negatives. And so a really great thing to have a discussion about is, are false positives and false negatives bad? Are they equal? Uh, in this case, I think we can argue that a false negative is worse than a false positive. And at that moment, what I'm hoping is that a number of you are slightly confused and saying, wait a minute, negative, wait, which one is negative? Because it is so confusing in medical stuff to say, oh, positive is that you have a heart attack whereas we think of that as a negative event. But if you have a positive test for a disease, that's what we're told. And that's typically a negative thing. And so... And Tim, I mean, the, these are raw numbers too. So if we're two out of two million... False yes. Rates, that's one thing. If it's two out of 10, that's another. Exactly. Right. And so all of these are really good things that, that we can bring up right here that might be harder to bring up easily and sort of being able to point at the number um, in the uh, the in the R environment if that's your first exposure to it. We want to make it so that kids ultimately when they are exposed to it um, understand what's going on better. Okay so Every, anybody want any, any more here? Have you played with this enough? So Dean seems to think so. Can I? Uh, I, I do have a question that you, kind of a little bit out of the realm of this particular tree. When you said, uh, I, I forgot exact, exactly your words, um, when kids are exposed to this and all that, when are kids going to be exposed to this? Well, that's a great question. I, sh I should have put that on one of the things that, that we, could, uh, we could all type into. Um, at the moment, at the high school level, I don't think this appears anywhere. And I'm, I'm going to say as an advocate, I think this is pretty interesting and it might really help high school level kids do some thinking that they need to do. Um, yeah, I think a lot of what we talk about in these seminars is material that is not currently 
in the school curriculum, but because data science is new and data science education is just being born, it's looking to the future and saying, these are things that we need to have in the school curriculum. Right, and the overall topic is what we might call classification. If you've been teaching high school statistics, you know there's a lot of finding parameters, right? But it's not as much about deciding which group somebody belongs in. So this is from a page from that same book. Um, and suppose you have two, uh, two variables and they're being very official and abstract, so they just call them X1 and X2, and you have a population whose membership in groups is separated like this, what would you do in order to tell, based on X1 and X2, which group these guys ought to be in? And you can imagine we could partition this space to say, oh, if X1 is greater than six, it's in the plus group. But if it's X1 is less than six, look at X2, and if X2 is greater than six, it's in the triangle group, otherwise it's in the circle group. Right? That's a way we might be able to describe it. But we don't do anything like that in the curriculum for possibly a number of reasons. One might be that we say, oh, that's, that's a computer thing, right? Because you'd have to write these Boolean expressions with if and stuff like that in them. And even though Boolean logic is a, is a mathematical topic, we tend not to do that. We tend to wait for computer science to come around. But in computer science, they might be more interested in algorithms and other things and not as interested in something involving data. So that's where data science appears. And data science didn't even exist hardly before like 2012. And so uh, anybody who's written a framework for next generation science standards or the core standards or any European set of standards will not have had data science in their universe when they go to do this. So I'm gonna do another slide, yeah? A question, would one, one way it might connect with some of these standards is if you think of this as a modeling assistant. I am so glad you said that because- Would you agree? <laughs> Oh, absolutely. And in fact, I, well, I'm trying to, you know, in trying to figure out where does this fit in schema that people have for things. And I think this is an example of modeling. And let us come back to that in a bit. But I want to get us to be participating. I want to zoom ahead. And Tim, I'm gonna... Tim, Tim yes. one other quick question. Let me just jump in. I put this on the chat. Um, yeah. This is yeah. important. Hi. Um, AP Computer Science Principles course includes yes. this, and whatever, 54,000 students took it the first year. I expect close to 100,000 students take it this coming year. Um, right. And that, that's kind of like squarely within that. Yes, I agree. And uh, if, if I dare complain about AP Computer Science Principles, in the, in the materials that I've seen, there is a unit about data. And in fact, the, 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 the principles document for APCSP has one of its, I think it's seven units, is about data. And, that's, and this is where that should reside. But I think that they could do, the curricula that I have looked at could do better in the data part. And that I think that the wonderful imaginative computer science parts of the curriculum are terrific, and the data part is just not as imaginative as the rest. And I think they could use more imagination about what they do with data. Uh, can I interject something, Tim, please? Sure. Um, I was drafted by a neighbor to uh, help a group of fifth grader compete in a math, uh, it's not the cat one, it's something else anyway. And I was actually very much impressed by their eagerness, their desire to learn. My background is high school mm -hmm. <laughs> teaching, and it was a really big difference between yeah. high school kids and, and fifth grades. But um, they know uh, how to present data in a pie chart. 
Mm -hmm. uh, they're not quite as good on, on graphs, but they're pretty good on pie charts. So I would submit that the elements of data science can be put into the curriculum at a very early age, fifth grade or so, and may not even want to call it data science, you know? Right, yeah. And, and uh, you know, even a tree at some point can be part of, of this representation of mathematical decisions or modeling or whatever you want to call it. And uh, it doesn't have to be computer. It doesn't have to be software writing. It doesn't have yes. to be the technical part. I, I mm -hmm. love software and I, I, I wrote code and all that, but this is different. And it is more approachable in a way, mm -hmm. more yeah. approachable at an early age. Yes, and I think that, in fact, trees, even though they are not in the high school curriculum, might be a great place to start for all the reasons that you mentioned. And um, Jesse has, has mentioned stuff about data moves, and I've recently been writing about data moves and the idea of, no, 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 you don't have to, don't have to think of it in the computer set. You, if you had a card for every case, you had a card for every one of those people who came to the ER, and you said you just you want to sort them. How will you do the sort? Well, that's making a tree, and you could fifth graders could do it, maybe with a little bit of scaffolding, and certainly with something that's not about heart attacks and has has better variable values than yes or no. So that's a really good point, and I completely agree. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip a slide, and I'm gonna move on to data that most of us are probably familiar with, the fabled Titanic data. Um, we have 1,309 passengers. A limited number survive. Of course, we're interested in which ones survive, and let's, instead of me telling you to do everything, I'm just gonna, we're gonna go to the data, and we're gonna see what we've got, and let everybody play, and then on the next slide, you can reflect on what you think you found. So here we have the Titanic passengers, including their names and their ages and everything like that. And just before we start, I wanna show you another feature of this tree thing. Okay, so watch carefully. So here are 500 out of the 1,309 lived, Suppose I think that age is important, okay? So I'm gonna take age, and I'm gonna drag it in here, and huh, says age is low and age is high. What does it mean by low and high? So if I point at high and wait, it says age is greater than 33.025. Suppose I wanted to separate the adults from the children, and I said, I want to take the 20-year-olds and above and make those adults, and make the 19-year-olds and below make those children. Here's how to do that. If I point at this box where I have placed age, I can see a trash can, which will let me get rid of age, and I see a little gear. So I'm going to press the gear, and this is the attribute configuration panel. And it says the left branch and the right branch. I'm gonna make the left branch is low and instead of being less than 33.025, I'm gonna change that number to 20. And furthermore, just to make life better, I'm gonna call these children, childress, children, and I'm gonna label this one adults, and then I'm gonna click done. Uh, you have a gap. Do I? Between 20 and 33. Oh, I'm surprised if there is something wrong. This is supposed to change. I'm going to see if it will get it to click done. It was working before. Do I have a bug? I hope not. Oh, don't do this to me today. Well, I'm going to shift a little swap. Okay. Anybody else stuck? Okay, I'm gonna to have to reload this and see if. Uh, yes, Tim, this is Molly. I was, I got stuck on this earlier too. 
You did? Oh, that's very bad. Well, I, I apologize. I couldn't close out of it either. Huh. Okay, I'm going to see whether it just whether it happens again. I just click done. Will it let me out? No. Okay. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we have a problem. So don't use age. That's what I say. Um, and I just made a a uh, distribution of age and became convinced that it wasn't a, a good attribute to be deciding on anyway. Yes, I agree, but I'm very worried about the other things I plan to do oh. if this is broken, because it was not broken not too long ago. Um, why, why, why? Okay, um, anyway, so at this moment, you should go ahead, but don't use age, is what I say. Okay. And so you will see on the next, on the very next page, a reflection on Titanic data. Where you can add things. Right, it's not about prediction, is it? Oh, it's really stuck there. Okay, so I'm going to take a moment. And see how much trouble we're in in Arbor. How odd. Ah, okay, I know. So Arbor will be fine, we're okay. Yeah, what influences survival on the Titanic? So I'm gonna go back to look at my Titanic data. But let me do this. Yeah. Oh, wouldn't let me do that. Not here. No idea what's causing that problem. That's okay.
Okay, so let's take a look at our reflections since you've had a chance to play for a bit. And we're almost to the one hour mark. Ah, yes, so someone says, I would like to look at the data before making the tree. Wouldn't we want students to do that? Yes, we would. And here is one of the advantages of doing this in CODAP where we can do this thing. And I'm going to, I'm going to play Bill because Bill showed me what he did when he was wondering, oh, is it a problem uh, that we aren't using age? Should I even think about looking at age? So here's an example of what you can do. I'm gonna make a graph and I'm gonna put age on the graph. Apparently I've been scribbling. That's intriguing. I'm gonna put age on the graph. And so there's the age distribution. And I'm going to separate it by sex. No, not by sex, by survived. And now, when I look at this distribution, it's not obvious that age has much to do with survival. It's not dramatically different. But if I put sex on this instead, oops, that's sex and age, sorry, undo. I'm gonna put sex on the horizontal axis. Actually, let's, we can drop sex into the middle. Let's drop sex into the middle. And the females are, pur are males are, are purple and the females are orange. And it's really obvious that there's more orange in the bottom than there is in the top, proportionally. So we can say a couple things right now. One is, if you explore the data by making graphs first, you can get ideas about what attributes you want to put in the tree and what attributes you don't want to put in the tree. The other is the other direction. If you find something in the tree that seems to make a difference, you can look at it in the data and see how it's reflected in the data. But yet another thing that has to do on the visualization side is, look at this graph we just made. It's got survival and age and sex on it. So we're looking at three attributes at once, and it is not obvious what the best order of attributes is, what the best role for each attribute is in order to make the clearest possible display that shows you that age doesn't matter and sex does. And so, I find that very interesting, and it's another thing that our students probably are not asked to try in lots of different ways and to develop, let's call it data craft or data taste about how to make this kind of visualization. But this is one visualization of the data, and the, the tree is a different visualization of the data. But I do agree that looking at the graphs is a great way to uh, get insight. And does clicking on those nodes in the tree also? Oh, what a great idea. Graph? Okay, so here is, I'm interested, for example, in looking at the males who had first class tickets. So if I click here, now all the males with first class tickets are selected over here. And they are also selected in the table. That is, in CODAP, anytime you select something, it is selected in every representation. And so if I want the females in first class, I will click there, and that they are, of course, almost all down here in the ones, in the survived, because the first class females we're given uh, first class treatment. First class treatment in the in the realm of uh, the the lifeboats. So um, I, I have a question there. Uh, so you just used a leaf of a tree or branch or twig, whatever we're calling it, as a two dimensional filter for a graph. 
Yes. But a tree, a, a leaf tree, twig, a tiny leaf um, can be an n-dimensional filter is what I'm realizing now, right? So That's whereas, correct. Or we could not have done that. Right. So we can grow this tree to as many branches as we like, and we can select at any level in the tree, which is kind of wonderful. Could you just show us that by selecting all the females? Yeah. So if we get all the females, uh -huh. now you can see, oh, all the, all the orange ones got selected. And so here are females in classes two and three, and a lot more of them died. Yeah. Okay. But well, let's That's, look. Yeah. I mean, a really interesting perspective on, um, you know, a way of filtering or thinking about exploring the data set. Yes, and trees like that before. Yeah, and let's just let us point out again. Actually, let's look at the first class males. Okay, and those of you who have not been around CodeApp before, this notion of filtering. I select this graph and I go to the eyeball menu, and I do hide unselected cases. Now, in this graph, I have only first class men, men with first class tickets. And I can say, oh, I wonder how much they paid for their tickets. And in pre-1970 British pounds, that is the amount paid by the people who survived and did not survive, who were males who bought first class tickets. And I can see the means, no, I can't. They're not appearing at the moment. I'm not sure why not but I will ignore that. Okay, so I wanna look again at what people have written here. Um, cabin class makes a difference, sex makes a difference for one and especially second class, if you studied in that. Um, cannot get settings to adjust for any variables, tried both Chrome and Safari. There is something wrong with this document. I just tried it with one of the ones we're gonna use in the future and it worked for me. I hope it will work for everybody when we get there. Um, whoops. Prediction makes no sense here is a really important point. Um, we can't predict, it doesn't make sense to predict who is going to survive the Titanic because it already happened. Uh, we are not going to get more people coming to our emergency room. No one is going to get on the Titanic, hopefully. Um, and But as the uh, poster points out, what influences survivals, and this is interesting, um, autom automatic detection of interactions, automatic interaction detection, AID, um, there are algorithms that could try to do this well. And there are those older al algorithms as well as modern ones like CART and Random Forest that will be looking for things and looking for things such as interaction. And once again, this is our chance to do it all on our own, which is kind of wonderful. Is the effect of class the same for males and females? That's an example of an interaction. And by looking at the tree with students, we can give them a concrete example of interaction. So let's move on. That all right? Are we okay to move on from the Titanic? Yeah. Okay, so here we go. Um, how have, I, how have I scribbled on this? Someone else scribbled on it. Oh, okay. I think I did. Okay, that's all right. Great, as long as, as, long as I know how it's happening. Uh, we're gonna play this thing called Arbor. So the original title of our project was Data Science Games. And because it was a National Science Foundation Award, it remains the title of our project, even though we are not spending as much time insisting that everything be a game. But this is kind of more game-like than some of the other things we have done lately. So you're going to be a xenobiologist, and we're, we're gonna see uh, alien creatures, and they have a number of different diseases. Each disease is a different game level, and we're only gonna work on one disease at a time. And the question is, how can you tell which creatures have the disease, or which creatures are predisposed to get the disease? It's not completely figured out exactly uh, the scenario for the game, but just go with it, I invite you. And you will see that there are three phases. There's one phase where you're just training, 
and you're collecting data and trying to figure out what works. And then you look at individual creatures one by one, and then you make a tree and you can let the tree make the diagnosis. There are lots of instructions and you should try it. And I'm going to go there and just make sure that you see what's going on. So here on the left are a bunch of instructions. And this is just a web page. And you can scroll up and down in the instructions as you see fit and see what you like. You may just want to play instead of read the instructions. I know some people are like that. And you have learned most of what you need to know. But if you haven't completely, you can try that. Um, here is the game itself, this small tile here. And uh, this blue number 200 is your current score. The game never ends, and so you can't tell if you win, but it's your current score. And you can make new cases in training, and at the moment you have 10 creatures. And five of them have the disease ague. And you can, the scenario is the name of the disease, and you can try different scenarios, and they are in order of difficulty. So, and they're also in alphabetical order, you will notice. So, ague is the easy one. Make sure you know how to work it. Um, and in fact, why don't I just do ague for you? Uh, it, will, it will rob you of having the easy win. But I'm going to say, huh, what's going on with ague? I don't know. Let me try hair. I could make a graph. I'm not going to do that. You should do that. I'm going to try hair. And I'm gonna say, well, wait a minute, what does this mean? So I'm gonna point at this box, and it says, in this scenario, positive means sick, and negative means well. This node represents 10 patients. These are all of the cases. Five are health equals sick. All right. So with blue hair, I'm gonna, this node represents five, these are hair equals blue. Of these, zero are sick. Oh. The blue-haired ones are well, and the pink-haired ones, five of five, are all sick. So I'm going to show my diagnosis leaves. I'm going to say, you guys are well, and you guys are sick. And there I've made a tree, and it looks like it's pretty good. But let me move on from training to one by one. And it says, my first case, pink hair, purple eyes, six antennae, six tentacles, 116.6 centimeters of weight, 174.2 kilograms. What's our diagnosis? Anybody? Speak sick. up. Sick. Okay. So Dean says sick. And so I say, our diagnosis is sick. Why sick? Oh, pink hair. So I click sick. Yay, my previous case was sick. I got it right. And at the bottom, I have added another case because I just got that one. And as I move over here, I can see my diagnosis was sick and the analysis was it was a true positive. Tim, just one question, please. When I play this yeah. game, how do I increase the number of training uh, in the training set? Okay, so if I go back to training, how many, oh, I, got you. Just, I, got you. I can make new cases. How many? As okay. many as I want. Gotcha. I recommend sticking to 10 at a time. If you make a thousand cases, things will get slow. So with a few dozen, you will do fine. And so, and then when I'm, when I'm ready to, when I think my, uh, my tree is good, I can go to auto and I say, let me run 10 cases with the tree. I'm going to just let the tree make the decision. And so I run the tree and it says, oh, 10 cases were processed, 10 were correct. Great job. I'm so proud of myself. Okay, so you are now entitled to go forward and try different things. You can check out to make sure you know how to do ague. You can do these others. Um, let me show you how the, um, the height will work. Oh, let's see if it will break. Suppose I decided I wanted to do height. Oh, height is low and high. Let me see if this will work correctly this time. And so yeah, I'm how does it pick the defaults? Sorry? How does it pick the default? 
um, rate. Uh, pick the default. Oh, it, it just picks the mean. Okay, so I've changed it to 100. Notice it, it changed there. And I'm going to make uh, low, I'm going to change it to short and tall. Uh, I'm going to make take high and make it tall. I click done. And now notice that the different um, branches are also labeled short and tall. This is useful. And they're, they're based off of 100. And no one is shorter than 100. And so no one was there. So. Now you can go forth and try different things. If you, if you get to the, you should try a couple of the first five, five or six, and then try one of the last two. The last two are qualitatively different from the first few. How long are you going to give us? Let's give, let's, let's see, it's 10 after, let's check in in about five minutes. I'm not going to get that far. I know. Office. We're just checking in. We're going to check in in I about see. five minutes. Okay. And then the next slide, if you switch back to the slides, the next slide has things to talk about where you can record things to tell us. I wish we could shop around and see your screens. I'm having trouble switching to something else. The, the, the tree on the right side, when I tell it to refresh, sort of squishes everything down, and then I can't see the things I need to drag and other things. Huh. Let me just, did you, you clicked refresh everything, or? I'm changing the scenario to some other thing. Okay. I'm going to change the scenario to botulosis. All right. And then you have to re uh, click refresh everything. Okay. And, uh, oh, wow. Oh, yeah, but I don't have any cases at the moment. Right. So you I'm going to make some cases. Yeah. It starts getting weird over there. Well, there are... There are this, there's this crud down at the bottom, which looks exactly like the buttons, but don't use them. Okay. Oh, if you, so I get refresh again, just because that's why maybe, maybe that was my problem. <laughs> and of course, don't forget you could make graphs. And so I'm also interested in how do you use graphs to know what you're going to do? Do we know how many people are on altogether? 21. Oh, really? That's great. Good. Welcome, everybody, even if we can't see you.
<laughs> that was a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> Someone had too small a sample. Yay. <laughs> We had a user post on the Zoom channel. They'd like to use the surveys to train machine learning. I see, I see this in the yeah. on the slide. Yeah. Uh, right. Oh, I wasn't keeping track. Has this been five minutes? Um, almost. Okay. Yeah. Let's see if this works. Maybe one more minute. Okay. Hmm. All right, well, let's get together for a bit, and I'm going to I'm going to release you shortly on another uh, one of the harder uh, levels, and take a look at some of the comments we've seen so far. I'm intrigued by this first one in the upper left, uh, the idea of training machine learning algorithms like sentiment analysis of social media that requires more human understood context than current algorithms handle. The idea of having a, a sort of manual interface for something that we often would say, oh, let's, let's invent an algorithm to create it, is a, I think a really intriguing idea. Um, of course, this is, I was picturing this as just getting to understand trees and some of the things behind the algorithms rather than actually helping the algorithms. So this is a very interesting, interesting thought. 
I think just the idea that by building this tree, we are training, we are creating an algorithm. Yes. That's, that's, that was not obvious to me at first. Actually, that's a really good point. When I look at the tree itself, that if I do this automated thing, that is an algorithm. We have specified an algorithm. We've specified the ifs, this, this set of um, nested if statements, essentially. We've created this visually. And, and when I run the tree, there's a loop. Yes, running the tree is applying the algorithm to everybody in our set. And so, in a way, the training set is training us, and we are creating the algorithm, right? And so, if, if I were learning about machine learning, this might be really useful to get the idea of what's actually happening with a training set. Um, I also love, I, I love the, I got bit by having too small a sample, because, <laughs> If you have a very small sample, yeah, you can sometimes think that something is important when it's not, because there's randomness. Um, I find having a graph helps me make the diagnosis when I'm in one by one. That's really interesting. That is, how do you, when you have in your mind what makes something sick? Like we said, oh, you need uh, orange hair or whatever it is. If it's something really simple, you can hold it in your head and you go to one by one and you look at each individual one, you say, I'm just looking for orange hair, I'm just looking for orange hair. But when it gets a little bit more complicated, how do you express it? And you could say something like, orange hair or purple eyes. You could say that to yourself. All I'm doing, I'm looking for orange hair or purple eyes. But that may not be the easiest way for everybody. Somebody else might really like to see the graph of hair and eyes. And then you drag, um, let's do this. I'm gonna make the graph. I've got botulosis data, right? Make more botulosis data and I'm gonna make a graph. And I know that botulosis is about hair and eyes. So I'm gonna do hair and then do eyes. And then I'm going to take health and drop it in the middle of the graph. Okay, and when I do that, I don't know if you can see it. Yeah, you can probably see the colors well enough, I hope, that the green ones, the sick ones, are all down here in this corner. And that's purple eyes and pink hair. And so it might be easier for some people to use the graph as the mnemonic and as the helper for turning the tree into the thing that the computer will understand. And so we have all these different representations, which someone else mentions here. I liked having multiple methods to go about solving the problem. You get stuck using the tree, you could put up a graph and vice versa. Multiple representations are something we've talked about at the K-12 level for a long time, and here's a way that technology helps us keep the multiple representations synchronized in a really interesting way. Um, a number of users love sorting. And so I do want to point out that it is possible to sort the table. So I've got these 30 cases, and if I sort by health, ooh, I can sort ascending by clicking there, and now, all the sick people are at the top. I'm gonna to highlight the sick people and say, do we notice anything in the table that is common among all the sick people? And you say, huh, look, pink and purple. It sort of jumps out at you. Now, if you had a thousand cases or the relationship were more complex, you might not notice it. But in this situation, sorting is really powerful. Um, let's see, I like being able to try another diagnostic for the same disease. I think I saw Bill typing that. What did you mean? 
Well, I was also the one who got bit by the small sample. Oh, okay. And so that serves I thought, you right. well, okay. let me see. Uh, maybe there's another factor here that's more uh, better at sorting. Oh, okay. And so I was able to uh, try that and uh, uh, bring my score back up above 200. Okay, yeah, you do want your score above 200, don't you? Uh, okay, uh, small sample helps understand the tree better, but as we add more features, it's it's hard to make a prediction. Good for learning. Yeah, whoops, well, sorry, yes. Literally data-driven learning, yeah. Now someone else says, I dared try Tyrannica, but it got stuck at a deep level. There was also a comment up here in Cardis, as students would likely do, I started dragging attributes to see what would happen. You just do it, right? You just drag, it, drag them all in. Um, quickly, too many choices. Yeah. <sighs> We have yet to release this on students and see what's the best approach. I think that it is a, it's a great learning lesson that you can easily make something that is way too complicated. And that will ultimately be the job of the machine. And so your job is to try to figure out, you say, um, find it, find, first find an attribute that sorts definitively or at least sorts pretty well. And so to do that, there's this thing that we have started doing when we play with this, is you make the graph and you put one attribute on there and see if it looks okay. And then you quickly make a bunch of different graphs in sequence in order to see if there's one that jumps out at you as being really better than the others. And use that sorting graph, that good sorting graph, as sort of a first step in the tree. So I'm gonna show you what I mean by that. And so in this case, I'm gonna make a different graph. I'm gonna put health on the vertical axis. And so I'm gonna say, uh, I got the sick people at the top and, and I'm gonna put uh, tentacles on the horizontal axis. I'm gonna see if tentacles makes any difference. So I look at tentacles and I see that I've got sick people in any number of tentacles and I got well people in any number of tentacles, but it looks like there might be something special about six, I'm not sure yet. And I'm gonna take weight and I'm gonna put it on the horizontal axis and say, do I see anything special about weight? Ah, oh, they're closer together up here in sick, but I'm not really sure. And now I'm gonna take uh, eyes and I'm gonna put them on the horizontal axis. And I say, whoa, there is something about eyes that is really definitive. So I think I'm gonna try using eyes first. And then I might do one of these tricks where I say, um, I really want to know what else is special about these guys. And so then I might sort, I might uh, filter the graph in order to look at only the sick ones. And we have a question from online. Yeah, uh, this is stepping back a few steps. So okay. um, the question is, why did the points move around when you moved health? When I moved health? Mm -hmm. Uh, wouldn't the sick ones already be in part of that graph? Yeah, and they were. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put tentacles back on and watch the sick ones. They're all green and they're all, well, yeah, they're all green and they're all up on sick. And they move to the place where they belong in the tentacles graph. I don't know, above the, above the corresponding layer of tentacles, I don't know if that's the question mm -hmm. that the questioner had. Yeah. Oh. No, it was an earlier graph. Um, th the first one you did that uh, you, I think it was purple, I mean, eyes and uh, hair or something oh, yeah. like that. Okay. And um, so here we have uh, tentacles and hair, right? And at the moment, we are showing three attributes because the green dots are sick. Okay, so the green dots are sick, and now I'm about to, in fact, let me, let me make the dots bigger so it's a little clearer. Famous last words, that didn't work, did it? Oh, there you go. Okay, so the green dots are sick, and now I'm gonna put health on, a, on an axis. And when I do that, all the green dots are gonna go, they all have to move to the appropriate place for health. No, the other time you put health in the middle when okay. her and eyes were the axes. Mm. 
Okay, well, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll put eyes back here instead of tentacles. Okay, so now they were all, they're all down here. And I'm gonna put health on the vertical axis. And what we're gonna see is because uh, sick is gonna be on the top, all the dots on the bottom have to move to the top, all the green dots. So they all move up there because they're going into the appropriate place for the axis, which now shows sick. Is, was that the move that you <laughs> worried about? No, you had eyes and hair without health in the middle. Okay. Moved health into the middle. All right. So I'm gonna put hair back. And just so we see, how do I get rid of health being in the middle? Oh, remove legend health. So I do that. So now they're all orange, okay? And now I'm going to put health in. Let's see what happens. See if they move around, which they might. So a couple of them changed position a little bit, but mostly they stayed where they, they stayed in their cells. So um, there is currently a bug that caused oh, well. that motion to happen, a bug in CODAP. And the next release uh, has a fix for that bug. Oh, okay. Yay. Great, okay. So anyway, uh, we could try different things and decide which one, which attribute is the one that seems to help the most for now. And interestingly, that is at the root of some actual algorithms, computer algorithms, that try each attribute separately and see which one does the best job and use that, the best one, to uh, make the first separation in its tree. Okay, so there are algorithms that do exactly that. And so students, in talking about having too many things in their tree, might actually come up with an algorithm that is the same as an algorithm that the big dogs using R might have implemented, which is pretty cool. So when you say algorithm in that context, you're talking about a machine learning algorithm that creates, creates the, the tree. tree. That's right. That's what I'm talking about. Because ultimately, when things get complicated, we don't want to do this by hand. Right? We want the, the computer to help us as much as possible make good decisions. But this is going to help us understand what it means to make a good decision. So I would like us right now to uh, explore that by everybody play um, Sumanoma. So I'm going to change to Sumanoma and let's see what we think makes a difference. And so let's just spend a couple minutes and everybody see if you can figure out, I'll tell you, it's a one attribute disease. Which attribute makes the difference? So one attribute. Doesn't look like hair, doesn't look like eyes. Might be tentacles. Uh-oh, if I get more data, it starts to fill in. It might be related to tentacles. Okay, so what do you think? What, what effect, Noma? 
Right. So, is that chance? Yeah, I want I, I want to be a short, whatever I am. You want to be short to be well, you think? Okay. Anybody have other ideas what it might be? So I'm going to put height on the horizontal axis of my graph here, and I see that wow, wow. the well well ones are shorter. But it's not a perfect yeah. split. Mm -hmm. Weight was a little better, wasn't it? Wasn't so I'm going to I'm going to look at weight and say, huh? It's still overlap, though. Could be, but there's still overlap. Show me how to put a uh, movable value in there. Okay, so I'm going to do a. Huh, I don't move movable value. Okay, so I'm going to put a movable. Did it do it? No. Huh. And under ordinary circumstances, you could put a movable value there. And, and Bill was able to, but maybe because I'm projecting, I don't know. Movable value. Oh, yeah. add. Good. Good. There we go. OK, so I can now slide this thing along and try to find a good value. And I can do the same with height. and I can slide it around and try to find a good value. But it does look like, if I, if I select all of the, the tallest well ones and I put weight on, sort of like, what's going on here? It does look like if you're taller, you're heavier. So in fact, if I put height and weight on the same graph, oh, there is a relationship. Which makes sense, you know, if you're a taller creature, you probably weigh more. So what is the... Can you put uh, health in the middle of that? Oh, let's put health in the middle. Oh, what a good idea. Uh, 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 uh. Okay, so now hmm. this gives us this interesting sort of picture. So what do you think, based on this, makes the biggest difference, weight or height? Weight. Weight. Well, yeah, it looks like height's pretty good, but it looks like weight might be might be better. But we could try it either way. What about so, introducing a, a new variable weight height ratio? Oh, we could. We could make body mass index. Ooh, can we do that? We could, and I'm looking at the time oh, and thinking, <laughs> let's not do that at the moment because I know the answer. But this is a great idea, um, because we would not do any better with the weight height index than we can do with just weight. But you can imagine that we have a vertical line sort of slicing it, but no, there is no line that's going to completely separate these two groups. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, let's do weight, and I'm going to put health back on the vertical axis. We could do height, and that would be really interesting and instructive. Um, and I'm going to put this movable line here. I'm going to add it and see if it really did appear and say, well, where do we think would be a good place to break it? We could kind of go in here. And I'm, I'm looking at this, and it says something like 223.3. I kind of like the number 222 because it's easy to remember. And so I'm going to, don't I get the false negative, false positive question right? Here. You do, and that's why I want to be sure to put this on here. I'm going to do. I'm going to put weight on here, and I'm going to change its number to 222. And I say done. Oh, I'm going to say left branch low is skinny, and I will call this one fat. And now we know that zero of my 25 skinny ones that's down here. Oh, wait, but I haven't said anything. I want to say zero of the 25. I want to say those are well, and I'm going to say these are sick. Whoops, sick. And if I select all of the ones who are to the right of the line by clicking on the ones that I have diagnosed as sick because I think that they're fat, 
I notice that there are some down here and there are some up there. These are false positives. And here it says there are three false positives and there are my three false positives. And I have zero false negatives because I've just missed it here. So maybe that's okay and I'm willing to accept it. But I'm not completely sure. And so I wanna show you this other cool thing that we can do. So I wanna say, what, what am I doing here? I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna say, I'm going to emit data. And that did something which you could not see. And it's not done emitting it yet. I don't know, I wonder if it's succeeded. I'm gonna go here to tables, and I've got this other table called classification tree records. And what I've just done is I've emitted the information I have on true negatives, false positives, and everything like that. So that when I go back here and I say, maybe I should use a higher number, let's try 230. And I click done. Now I have some false negatives and false positives. And I click emit data. <clears throat> And I have another line in my table. Over here, I have this thing called sensitivity. And this is, and I've now forgotten exactly what it is, but I'm going to look at the formula. The formula for sensitivity mm. is it's the number of true positives divided by the total of true positives plus false negatives. Wait a minute. So that's the number of correct things, correct diagnoses among all the ones that I have diagnosed as sick. So that's the true positives I diagnosed as sick, the false negatives, no, the, all the ones that actually were sick. Okay, so. I, I just want you to know this makes my head hurt. Okay, so this is an example of when it makes our head hurt. You look online and you try to find out what sensitivity is and how it's different from specificity. And if you're into um, medical stuff and epidemiology and dealing with effectiveness of drugs, specificity and sensitivity are really important and you gotta know them backwards and forwards. And frankly, I forget them within about two days after knowing them. But this is the formula for sensitivity. So true positives, those are things we've diagnosed correctly. False negatives, those are ones that we diagnosed as being well, that's the false part, but we diagnosed them negative, so they were in fact sick. Those are these, these two here. They were in fact sick, but we didn't catch them. So these are all the ones, TP plus FN is the total sick ones, and TP are the ones we diagnosed correctly. So we diagnosed 0.833, of the sick ones correctly. Whereas in our original one, we diagnosed all of them correctly. So, this, so we can add additional formulas in which we can write expressions for how good our tree is. Like suppose we say, I'm, I'm interested in the number of trues divided by the number of falses. The ones I got right divided by the ones I got wrong. And I'm gonna call it good. And I'm gonna make a formula. Come on, edit formula. And I'm gonna call this true positive plus true negative divided by false positive plus false negative. And I'm gonna apply that. And so in our original one, we had a good of 12 and this one is a good of nine. So by that measure, the current split point is not as good. But I can adjust my split point and look at all the different possible goodnesses of this tree. And so- and Tim, every time you adjust your split point, it's automatically calculating the tree, right? Uh, no. Oh, yes, yes, but I have to adjust the, the split point right. separately. Right. 
and, and so and you have to emit data each time yes mm -hmm. yeah so when i redo this and i'm going to redo it at 220 and i say emit data right. this is just as good as 220 is just as good as 222 those numbers might look exactly the same and, and you just need to automate the scan of the split point and then yes that's right well I, that's what i want i want a slider <laughs> that's right we want it on a slider and have it uh, record all of these things every time but what proportion of high school classes will get to that level of wanting the slider or just to this level of wanting the slider um i don't know i think it's zero i think it's bigger than zero it's got to be bigger than zero okay jesse what do you think you're you're muted yeah i for high schoolers i'm not sure um I'm not, I'm not working in high schools anymore. I think a lot of it comes down to are we teaching, are we teaching data science as a standalone course or are we teaching it embedded with content? If it's not zero, it's close to it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, so it's interesting. I would, I would say anyone who actually clicks on the settings, I would want a live update of the table while I'm adjusting my setting with a little slider so I could kind of fine tune it. Because otherwise, I'm doing. To, I'd be if I'm using the settings. I feel like I got to do guess and check. So I think the proportion of students who would want the slider is non-zero. But I think the proportion of classes where it's something that they do is zero. Right. And I should point out for Dan's benefit, if you have this configure open, and you change the number, uh, three hundred. Look at the true positive, true negative display down here. Those numbers do change. So you can, so you can, click on you can mess with those, up and but down. you just, and in fact, you can emit the data then also. So I, 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 think, the, I, I think the question is a, um, is a red herring in some ways. Um, I think the question we're really asking is with the right affordances, you know, if, it were, if it were set up in the right way that we can't imagine right now, um, how often would it be useful to home in on a discrimination point in your decision, in sort of the, the grouping, the chunking thing? And I bet the answer to that would be, you know, yes, more, much more often than the answers to the questions that we've just been asked. Uh -huh. Okay. And there is another aspect to it, which we have not gotten to, is that when you make the tree more complicated, you have a more complicated situation, do you do better by adding additional things to the tree? And that's another thing that you can study. And, and I think that's a really important lesson for, for students. Mm -hmm. You know, analysis paralysis. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that's a good point. And for me, the other thing that's so exciting is we got to invent our own measure of how good the tree was. And there are multiple measures of this, but if we make our own measure, and now we can start to see when it gives us uh, results that we think are kind of bogus or not. Now we're nearly done, we're practically out of time. There is of course a lot more that I wanted to talk about. Um, when you go to the slides or to the Google Doc, there are other things you can explore. Um, one of them is we have real breast cancer data uh, that you could explore if you wish. And the, there's a little bit of stuff in there about what it's for and what I would say to you, but you know, how would you diagnose it? If you use radius as your explanatory variable, uh, the issue of where do, you, where do you put the cut point for the radius of the tumor is what we're trying to say. Is it malignant or is it benign? Uh, that's an interesting question. And that's an example of a data set where if you use three or four different attributes, you can do much better than with just one. Um, I wanted to talk about quality of trees. We did that a little bit. Um, regression trees are a different goal. We've just talked about classification trees, where the goal is to say yes or no. But you can also, like we did at the very beginning with baseball, you're trying to predict the salaries of the players. We can do other things, um, such as we have a income data in CODAP from ACS. We have data from California where we have a thousand people and we have their income 
sex, race, education, and things like that. What predicts income better? Um, and then we could also talk about what makes a good regression tree where one of the answers is, it's like analysis of variance. Can you, how much of the variance can you explain? And the statistic that we have there is not true positives and true negatives, but rather uh, the sum of the squares of the, of the differences from the local, the mean in the whatever group you're in. Um, that's saying that very quickly. If you haven't done analysis of variance in the last year, that will seem opaque, but you may uh, play around with that and see what's going on. Anyway, uh, we have come to the end of our time. Uh, we've done a little exploration on trees and its relationship to learning about data science. I am encouraged by your participation and the great ideas that you've had. Um, and I've become just a great fan of trees in the last year. There's so much I don't know about them, you can hardly imagine. Um, I wish I'd seen more of your faces. The screen will only let us see about 11 at a time. It's really great to see Molly's face, who's just appeared again. I haven't seen Molly in ages. Um, and I bet there are others of you there whom I know and others of you whom I hope to see in a future workshop or webinar. So thanks very much. Great. Anything you need to say? Uh, yeah, Tim, if you could stop sharing the screen, I'll go ahead. Oh, yeah, sorry about that. We, I'm going to stop sharing. Uh, oh. And we're back. Thanks, Tim. Thank you. Paul, thank you all so much. This is just fantastic. Thank you, so much. Thank you Tim. Marvelous. You're welcome. Uh, thank you. Uh, Tim, can we explore and perhaps in another webinar, not the tools, but the curriculum? Uh -huh. wow. ah, that is a great question, Dean. Um, I'll, I'll reach out to you about that yeah, to follow up, I think. Yeah, because I, I mean, I, 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 I love the tree tool that you created and, and, you know, there's a lot of issue to it, but I think where do we put it? Right. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we're, we are struggling with that and it would be great to have any sort of meeting. Yeah. About that. And, Definitely and, I'm, and I'm wondering if you can have somebody from an education department, from the people that create the curriculum that approve of it, you know, that would be interesting. Can you, can you recommend someone, Dean, who would have ideas about this? No, I can't. I hit a wall when I try to do statistics, and they prefer calculus because that's what college admission is all about. Wow. Right. No, I, I think I might have some ideas. Okay. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll definitely chat about that. You, with you guys. I'm, yeah. When's the next one? Uh, yes, so it's just going to um, do some wrap-up activities. So thank you, Tim. Thank you, Dean. Thank you, everybody, for your participation. It was wonderful to be here with you this morning. I really appreciate all the work that we did. Um, we will send a link to recorded session shortly. Um, if you enjoyed this webinar and you'd like to attend future data science education webinars, our next webinar is on March 28th. We're going to be having Steve McGee join us. He's of the Learning Partnership. Steve will be speaking about the Data Jam project he's working on, and I think I might probe him about some curricular materials too as some follow-up activities. You can sign up for future webinars at concord.org forward slash meetup. Please stay connected with us on Twitter. We love your tweets. We're at codeappdatasci and at concord.org. Use the hashtag datasciEd and it will come to our attention. If you have any additional questions or resources, we'd love to respond to you. Just drop some questions in our Google Doc that Tim shared with you, or you can also send us an email to at dset at concord.org. Please feel free to visit our website, codap.concord.org, and you can connect us with us as well there. I uh, look forward to seeing you all at our next webinar, March 28th, and thank you all very much. Good to meet you all. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Francesco.